So, uh, so, so I've just been the Zoom. Uh, last week I was told that Zoom tells you now when it's being recorded. There you go. Um, we're, I want to spend just a couple of minutes before we get into the rites of healing on the Thanksgiving for the birth or adoption of a child on page 215. And the reason I want to talk about this is I, I think this is this is the great I, I, I'm not real comfortable with this analogy. It's it's mechanical, but if I can put it this way, it's one of the great tools in our toolboxes as as Anglican priests to ha have this service to be um, conversant with it, to be comfortable with it, and to use it as widely as we as we can. Um, it was um, it it was part of the uh, part of the 1979 book, which is where I began to use it, and in in some ways it it traces um, its heredity to the uh, to the service for the churching of women in uh, in late medieval times uh, after a woman had given birth and um, gone through a period. Uh, uh, afterwards, then there was basically a service of readmission, which was service for the churching of women. Um, and then it, it evolved to become a service for the thanksgiving <laughs> of the birth of a child. Uh, I mean, so that's, that's kind of the, uh, the heredity of this service. Um, but this service I, I have found and used, um, I've used it a couple of times for people who have adopted, but uh, primarily for people in uh, congregation, families in the congregation where there's been uh, a birth. And, and what I found happened is that when I would use it for non-Anglican friends, I would go visit, I would take a couple of prayer books and we use it. And I would have uh, people who are not Anglicans, um, at that point, not Episcopalians, who um, would, would ask me to come to the hospital. I wasn't their pastor but they would ask me to come to the hospital and leave this service. And so I had, I had a number of, of couples that I knew, uh, people in intervarsity leadership, people in other uh, ministry partners and other, other denominations who would ask me to do this service. And of course, um, oftentimes it would be done with relatives in the room or friends visiting. And so it can be an evangelistic tool. Um, it, it certainly is a great tool to, uh, to have, uh, as I said, in your toolbox. So just let's, let's look just for a minute at the rubric at the top of the service. Um, the birth or adoption of a child is always an occasion for Thanksgiving and prayer and family and community. The right is provided for use in a hospital or a home. And I have that in my noted copy here really underscored because um, I, I think this is best used if you can do a hospital visit. Obviously we couldn't during COVID, but uh, it was one of the things I always tried to do um, when a baby was born uh, in, in the parish was to visit at an appropriate time and do this actually in the hospital room um, where the baby was present. Um, sometimes that's not possible. So a visit to the home as soon afterwards. The rubric goes on and says, during public worship or in some other appropriate place. So, so the rubric uh, allows us to use this in public worship um, and that's okay. But the reality is that with uh, many of our people who are newcomers who come from evangelical backgrounds, um, they, they are tempted to see this as a, uh, a substitute for baptism. And that is what it is, it is not. And, and so um, that's why I like to do it in the hospital or in the home, not in a, in a public place, because it's often seen by people from, uh, from a, 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 a believer's baptism tradition as kind of our version of infant dedication. And it really isn't. Um, I, I, somebody was telling me recently uh, about somebody, uh, a, a couple who approached Father Brian at our church, uh, Spirit, and, and said, we're, we're not sure we believe in infant, infant um, baptism. Uh, could we have an infant dedication? There is one in the prayer. They had looked, they had looked at the service. And, 
And Father Brian said to them, wonderful response. You, you could file it away for use in the future. He, he said, well, what, what do you think happens in baptism? What's, what's going on there? And they, they enumerated their concept of, of baptism. And he said, um, I, I'm sorry, he said, what do you think's going on in infant dedication? And they, they went through what they thought that meant. And he said to them, that's baptism. So um, be careful not to have this replace baptism in the life of the church. And there's a rubric at the end of it. Um, uh, finishing the rubric, if used in a public worship, this takes place at least or at the close of the office. If used apart from public worship, a passage of scripture is first read. Luke 8, 15 through 17, or the gospel appointed for the day is appropriate. And I'm not going to go line by line um, through this liturgy. I'll leave it on your own because uh, I don't want to spend a long time on it. But it's uh, what, what I'm really doing is saying, um, spend some time with it and, and use it when, when you do get to visit when there is a new baby born or when there is a, a child who is adopted. Um, you'll see on page 221, additional directions. The minister shall encourage parents not to defer the baptism of this child. This rite does not serve to replace holy baptism, but provides the opportunity for families to give thanks upon the birth or adoption of the child. Um, there you go. So the, uh, the editors of our prayer book knew that that was going to be a temptation. Um, particularly at this time with people entering our Anglican churches from other traditions. And then there's a very interesting rubric that follows um, that, that has been part of the prayer book um, almost back from the beginning. The minister of the congregation is directed to instruct the people from time to time about the duty of Christian parents to make prudent provision for the well-being of their children and the duty of all persons as stewards of God's provisions to make a will. Okay, so here's, um, here is the direction of the prayer book that we as clergy are to be proactive in talking to our people about making wills, about um, trusts, about taking care of all the legal stuff that, that uh, needs to be done, uh, particularly wills. I'm not gonna ask how many of you have a will or a trust. Um, you're, you're all considerably younger than I am, um, but you should already have one. Um, you should have made provision, um, um, whether, you, whether you're single or married for um, the disposition of your property. And particularly if you marry and have children, that's really, really important. I just, I learned, um, I learned something last night that I did not know. Um, I was visiting a family whose, um, who's the, the father had died from COVID in January, February. We we're doing um, a uh, service for him next week uh, because they wanted an in-person service. Um, but the, the father and the mother had gone through a divorce about two or three years ago. And uh, so she was sharing with me that in California, when you divorce, if you have a trust, it automatically dissolved. And so um, there was basically no will, but they didn't know that, neither one of them knew it. And so when she went um, to have things taken care of after the father died, um, it had to go to probate, which is, which is always what you want to avoid. <laughs> That's stay out of the courts if you can help it. So I just I just learned uh, a, a little detail that I was not aware of that a divorce dissolves a trust, and that's really what that's state of the art now to have to have family trust, not a straight will, but a family trust uh, things. Um, they're running they're running about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars if you go through a lawyer. You can for a simple one you can do them online. Um, and probably um, or in your case, you could get away with doing one online um, and just having a simple one. Um, Esther, you have, you have kids, so it's a little bit more complicated there. And if, if you own a home and things like that, you want all of that uh, 
taken care of. And I'm saying all of that because that's under this rubric here. And it is part of your pastoral responsibility to talk to your people about it. When's a good time to talk about it? When a child has been born in a family, when there is a baptism of a young child. Um, and uh, that's why it's included here at the, uh, at the end of this section, baptism and then uh, Thanksgiving for the birth of a child. Um, the, uh, at the bottom, the last rubric I think is important just to pay attention to. In case of a single parent, the address so-and-so is shortened. In case of a mother dying in childbirth or some other tragic event, the church still proclaims, even through pain, that the child is a gift from God. One of the things I want to encourage you to do if you have not this already, and Astra, I don't know if you have, or John, if you have in any of your ministry there, is how do you deal with a family um, where the mother has died in childbirth um, or the, the child is stillborn and they didn't know it or um, dies within a day or two? Uh, one, of, one of the most absolutely most difficult pastoral situations to deal with um, is that kind of thing. So uh, you, it, it's, it's like a lot of things. You, um, you don't know how to deal with it till you deal with it. But, but uh, you can come in with, with some thoughts, with some prayers, um, being aware of the prayer book and the resources in the prayer book. And, and particularly um, uh, maybe talking or going along with the more experienced priest who has dealt with that before. So, so John, I'm thinking of you at uh, Christchurch Phoenix. And so if there's a crisis like this and, uh, and the, the rector is handling it to say, you know, may I, may I, may I just go with you and, and watch what you do? Um, and, and that's really, really important. Um, I think I shared with you, but if I haven't, I, I will next week. When I, when I was ordained congregational pastor, I, I'd never, uh, I had never done a burial service, a funeral or anything. I'd, I'd been to some, but I'd never been involved in one because I'd done student ministry. You know, we hadn't, we hadn't had any, any students in our student ministry die. So I, I called up a friend of mine from seminary, a uh, Presbyterian pastor who uh, lived uh, nearby. And I said, Dennis, the next, the next time you have a death and uh, a burial service coming up, call me and I wanna go with you through the whole thing, soup to nuts. So, so he called me up, um, took me to the hospital with him um, where, where the family was. Um, included me in the planning of the service, um, in his talking with, with the family. Um, I was at the service and then we debriefed afterwards. Um, and that was so helpful. You know, he was my age, but he was in a church with a lot of older people and he'd already done a bunch of, of burials. And he was, he was pastorally much better than I was anyway, probably still is, as a matter of fact. Um, but I would encourage you if, if you get an opportunity, I know this, this sounds predatory, but if, if the opportunity arises to go with somebody when, when a small child or mother in childbirth or one of these situations come up, to, to, if, if it's appropriate, if there is not a problem with, with the people involved, to go with somebody who has experienced that. That would also go for a suicide, by the way. Um, uh, those are those are the other really hard ones to deal with, uh, kind of thing. So, um, this is I, I I don't mean to sound grim. Um, when when you're when you're a young priest, um, people give you a large margin for error, and so um, I, I'm, don't get paranoid about this kind of stuff. Um, know that know that people have a wider toleration of screw ups when you're younger. That's by the way, one of my arguments for, for, for younger folk um, being ordained as opposed to being ordained at, at, at you know, 50 or 60 
you often hear people say, oh, they've got a lot of experience. But, but then people hold them to a higher standard, even though they haven't had any more experience than a, a newly ordained 25-year-old when it comes to a lot of these things. Um, but, but people will give you a lot of grace when you're younger because they realize you're, you're learning and, and, uh, and growing in there. And it's in these kind of situations, not the everyday situations, but it's in these kind of really hard situations that, that people learn um, to really call you their pastor and their priest. You really become that, not just in title, but, but in, in reality. And uh, that's an that's incredible privilege that, that we have in, in these situations. Birth of a child is one of those. You know, where we can go in to a, where a new child is born and, and we are welcome there, unlike most other people um, kind of thing, because we're, we're the family priest. And, and when it's a second and third child, then, then you're, it's almost like you're part of the family. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is as true now as it used to be, um, but when I started out in ministry, I was told that in heavily ethnic communities, um, rites of passage and how you handle them are, are really, really important um, because so much is placed on, on baptisms, on burials, on marriages. And, and in, uh, in at least certain ethnic communities, that's where your, uh, if I can put it bluntly, that's where your priestly star really shines and, and people really become confident in you and un understand your priesthood because they see it exercised in those rites of passage. Okay, that's all I really want to say about um, that. I went a little longer, but um, I found that, as I said, to be a really helpful uh, Thanksgiving uh, when a child is born. I want to talk about the the um, the rites of healing, and um, uh, I I was taken as I was looking back through the prayer book, and I underlined this before, but I was really taken by the opening paragraph on page two twenty two concerning the rites of healing. Um, and again, my, uh, my admiration for the editors of this prayer book, uh, whoever wrote this text, I, I think did a magnificent job. Healing was central to the ministry of Jesus, our incarnate Lord. Healing is central to the ministry of the church, the body of Christ. Spoken prayer, anointing with oil, and the laying on of hands are the principal outward means employed by the church for its ministry to those whose health is in any way impaired. The rite of reconciliation and the reception of Holy Communion are also gifts through which healing takes place. I think that's a magnificent paragraph because it, um, it really introduces us in a, um, I think a straightforward, and a good theological way to why these rites of healing are so important in our ministry. Um, after after the, the Holy Eucharist and the daily office, you know, the daily office we use daily, the Eucharist we use at least weekly. Um, this in, in the Psalms, which we're going to, which we use in the daily office, this is the section of the prayer book. Um, that I have used the most in, in my ministry. Um, confession or, or reconciliation, um, anointing the sick, and then um, communion for the sick. And so in my old 79 prayer book, you know, there's just, there, these pages have fingerprints on them. The prayer book opens to them directly um, because so much of, of my pastoral ministry um, not on the Sundays, but in, in um, kind of the weekdays revolved around these, these, uh, these three rites of healing. And, and so that's why I want to spend some time and really focus on them and, and get them fixed in your mind. I have, unfortunately, I have tons of background on them because when we were, when we taught them in Bethel Seminary, we spent a three hour class on each, each one of these three rites. So you're, you're, you're going to get the, uh, the 30,000 30, foot overview of it, not, not, the, not the plunging into them. 
but there, there is so much that, that can be said about them. Um, just to finish up the rubrics on, uh, on page 222, all Christians are called to be agents of healing. Nevertheless, the regular forms of healing ministry set forth in the prayer book are expected to be coordinated and ordered under the authority of the diocesan bishop and priest having spiritual charge. What, what this is going to introduce us to is um, kind of the whole question of what, what should we do and what can laity be permitted to do in these? Um, uh, because this is an issue, particularly in anointing the sick. Some aspects of healing ministry, most notably absolution and formal blessings, are reserved to bishops and priests. You already know that from, from the Eucharist. The use of holy oils, healing, and exorcism, like the ministries of which they are, they are assigned, may be extended to lay ministers by the bishop and priest having pastoral jurisdiction. So the, the common practice in anointing um, the sick with oil or oil of exorcism was to be done by clergy, by priests or deacons, but one of the th uh, priests or uh, bishops. But one of the things that happened in charismatic renewal is particularly the um, anointing for healing and using of blessed oils. Um, lay people were allowed to do that. And so I, I remember a conversation with my bishop in the Episcopal Diocese about 2000. And we were talking about um, who, can, who, can anoint the, who can anoint with oil the sick. And he was saying, and, and he was conforming to the, rare, the rubrics of a prayer book. He said, um, you know, that's, that's for priests to do. And I said, well, okay, but you need to know that in a number of our churches here, lay people use the blessed oil to anoint. And so if you don't want that, you, you better say so really soon <laughs> because, because that's, that practice is deeply embedded in a lot of our churches, particularly our churches that have pretty active healing ministries. And he thought about it for a while and he said, uh, well, it's a little like having your lay Eucharistic visitors take communion to the sick, isn't it? And I said, exactly. So if in your church you have lay people who are, are trained and commissioned to take the Eucharist that has already been celebrated to those who are sick, if, if you have them, that was by analogy um, what, we, what he allowed in, uh, in healing ministry. If, if you have lay people who are, who are trained in, in ministry of healing and under your direction as a priest and you have supervision of them, he, he allowed it. And, it's, and here it is in this new prayer book. So it's, it's obviously found its way. Uh, not, and I'm not saying I'm responsible for it because I'm not, but I, I, I'm sure a lot of us had conversations with our bishops over the years about this kind of thing. Um, uh, so, so I don't know, um, what kind of healing ministries you have asked her at St. David's. Um, my guess is knowing Jose a little bit, you must have had some, I know you do at Christchurch Phoenix, because I've talked to some of the people involved there. Um, but, um, um, the, when we go through the anointing of the sick, um, the, the, uh, some of it may apply to your lay people, not just to you as, uh, as, as priests or as future priests. Um, uh, and that's, that's basically what the rest of this rubric says. Um, and then the last, the last rubric, because, or the third rubric, because physical, emotional, and spiritual healing are often interrelated, it is particularly appropriate to encourage confession, reconciliation, and forgiveness in the context of ministry to the sick. The content of a confession <clears throat> is not normally a matter of subsequent discussion. The secrecy of a confession is morally binding for the confessor and is not to be broken. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, more about what that means, but you need to be aware of that rubric um, as, as a priest, that what is said to you 
uh, under the stole in a sacramental confession is, um, is not ever to be shared with anyone else, nor is it to be, nor are you to engage in the discussion of it with the person who has confessed outside of the confessional, unless that person brings it back to you um, and initiates it. That is basically what it means. Okay, let's talk about reconciliation of a penitent then. And um, so I have- um, Well, Ken and okay. David. Yeah, just go ahead. Quick question, outside of oil stocks, like a set that a priest has, you yeah. said to the bishop uh, that there's a, Anoint, uh, there's a uh, consecrated oil or you said uh, blessed oil that the parishioners are using. So yes. what, what does that mean? Did you have another reserved yes. set of oils for the people? Yes. Is that yeah. what you're saying? That is what okay. I was saying. Yeah. Okay. That's, and, and I'll, I'll mm -hmm. say more about that when we get into that in a few minutes. Um, let's, let's start with, okay. um, with the whole area of confession or reconciliation. Um, so one of the things that I think is important, and this is what I'm going to really skim over quickly, is kind of to understand where this, where this rite of reconciliation or confession or absolution, it's all, all three are terms used for it. Are, it's interesting, our uh, catechism uses the word absolution for it. Um, the, the 79 prayer book uses the word reconciliation as does our prayer book. Uh, people often call it confession. So, so understanding where it comes from is important. And, and the basic issue here, which the, the church at the end of the first century and the, and the second century dealt with was, what do you do with post-baptismal sins? Okay, that may sound, um, <laughs> that may sound foreign to us um, because being, um, being children of the Reformation, we we understand that um, we still continue to sin and often even if um, we progress we know we this was a real issue at the end of the first century and you see this being hammered it out out um, in in baptism um Sins are forgiven. Froze. No, we're not. Move a little closer to my, my router. Give me 30 seconds here. I had to move indoors, it froze up. Okay. Is that better um, coming through loud and clear for all of you? Cooper, I'm, I'm assuming. Yep, there we go. I see, I see everybody moving now, so we're in good shape. Um, so that's a, that's a debate early on in, in the Christian church. Is baptism just for sins before baptism? In which case, as, as uh, certain certain thinkers said, you should delay baptism as long as possible. Or is there some way that um, post-baptismal sins need to be dealt with? 
and and what you have developing in the second century is um, basically public confession of sins and and the whole um, development into the third and fourth century of of people um, being reconciled to the church. Uh, that's that's the that's the beginning of Lent, really, is a, a period of those who um, had been essentially excommunicated for for sins and were making a public confession and um, doing a public confession. Uh, and so the the earliest history of the church has to do with um, with sins being dealt with in a, in a more public manner. Um, but beginning uh, beginning in probably about the fifth and the sixth century, you begin to have more and more private confession, and that's basically coming from from the Celtic background that uh, that begins to uh, particularly in Anglicanism, the the Celtic Church, where you have uh, you have private confession to a priest and where you have uh, a series of books called penitentials. So um, for instance, in the, in the penitentials, um, if you stole your neighbor's cow, um, here's the penance you have to pay. If you, um, uh, well, whatever, it, it, was, it was a whole list of, of proper penance um, for specific sins. And uh, the, the uh, penitential books that had the greater currency were the ones where people, uh, I guess, trusted the author that best. And, and so what had begun as a public act, kind of confessing your sins one to another, um, and then a more structured public penitential reconciliation becomes by, by the high Middle Ages, becomes a private affair. Um, and it is, it is Peter Lombard in his sentences. Uh, it's, he is usually the theologian who is referred to with the, um, the, form, the uh, kind of the narrowing of the sacraments to seven, because in, in the early Middle Ages, you don't have a fixed number of, of, of sacraments. Um, but, but by Peter Lombard, by um, 1115, you have the seven sacraments defined. So you've got many to, to seven. And of course, the Reformation in many places narrows it to two at that point. So um, um, it, it, is, it is in the Middle Ages that you, you begin to confess to your priest. And by the late Middle Ages, um, what you have is you have confession that is necessary for communion. So the, the late Middle Ages, um, people are communing um, once a year, and you must make your, your confession to your priest before that. And now you have the involvement of, of, of purgatory and indulgences and all the kinds of late Middle Age uh, paraphernalia that, that plays into the Reformation and, and Martin Luther's um, uh, protest against that in his, uh, his 95 theses. So, so that's really kind of a, a, a quick um, movement into um, where, where we find ourselves as basically a church uh, that, that is the Reformation church in terms of a lot of our practices. Um, Luther, uh, allows for confession to be the third sacrament. So he talks about baptism, Holy Eucharist, and confession, which is basically um, a restoration of baptismal life. So he links it closely to baptism. Um, um, now, uh, L Luther, if you've read Luther, he is, he is not always consent. So <laughs> Um, sometimes it seems he's arguing to keep it. Sometimes it seems like he's saying there are, there are only the two dominical sacraments. I've talked to Lutheran scholars and it depends, it depends on your view of Luther, but, but I think um, the, the scholars that I trust the most say it, it, it's always in Luther's mind, um, even if it's linked closely uh, to baptism. Um, 
the the Anabaptist way of dealing with sin uh, in the life of a believer is to apply Matthew 18, um, 15, literally, the three confrontations. First, first you go to a person privately, then you go to a person, um, take witnesses, and if that has not um, dealt with the sin in the person, then you bring the person before the church. Um, and um, if the person does not uh, confess and seek reconciliation, then he or she is excommunicated. And, and that was really the Anabaptist way of dealing um, with this. Um, the, the Reformed way, which is really um, what, what the, the Anglicans came to adopt, the Reformed way of dealing with sin was to introduce uh, confession and absolution into the actual service. So how does, how does the daily office begin? How does morning prayer and evening prayer begin? That's, that's, that is the reformed, uh, that's Martin Bucer basically um, channeling John Calvin that, that this is how we do confession. We do it as a group um, in the church. Um, how, does, how does the Eucharist begin? Um, in, in the uh, 1552 prayer book, it, uh, um, you have the, uh, either the summary of the law or the Ten Commandments, um, and then you say, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Uh, you're, you're, you're confessing your sins, and, and often in a penitential way, the confession of sin, which we know can be put there, even in our service, is, is done there. But if it isn't put there, it you, you confess your sins before the offertory in, in, as a group in preparation for, for Holy Communion. Um, it's, it's interesting that the first prayer, 1549, had confession to least as part of visitation of the sick. It wasn't a separate part. The idea being that the sick are sick because they must have sinned. Um, and so when you do, when you visit for anointing, you urge the person to confess. That is, that is um, uh, in the original prayer book, that's confession. And that is dropped out um, later on. There is, there is no um, office for confession to a priest um, in, in our prayer book until um, the 1979 prayer book. So what happened um, for Anglicans is in, in the Catholic revival um, of the 19th century, as priests began to bring back auricular confession, or even earlier than that, some of the high church, uh, old high church Anglicans, um, they didn't have anything in the prayer book for confession of sin. So they basically made up their own right. <laughs> you know, it's like... Uh, so it's, it's kind of like uh, non-denominational churches. You need something, so you make your own thing up. And so we, we have various um, uh, kind of individual offices um, always ending with the, the absolution that you had out of the, the regular service. Um, but it is the 1979 American Prayer Book, which introduces, again, um, private auricular confession to the priest. And we've continued that in our prayer book today. So that's, that's kind of a, a, a little bit of the background. I have, uh, I have grossly simplified things, um, but I want you to get a sense of, of where, this is, uh, where this has come from. Um, I, I like what, uh, what one of our primary theologians, Rick, Richard Hooker says about it in, in, uh, in his ecclesiastical polity. In, in the 16th century. Baptism gives you life. Um, Holy Communion sustains your life. Confession recovers your life in Christ. Um, and, and I think that's, that's a really good uh, thing to, uh, to remember um, as we're going about it. Um, for us, um, what, one of the things that when I'm instructing newcomers, when I have in, in past years, I've talked about the fact that Anglicans have three different ways to deal with sin in their lives. Um, 
personal confession directly to God. We are heirs of the Reformation. Um, liturgical confession, which is in, in our liturgies, uh, we reference um, daily office and the weekly, the weekly Eucharist. And then sacramental confession, confession to a priest. And you can usually tell, um, particularly from uh, in newcomers, about their backgrounds from the way they react to it. People coming from um, particularly Roman Catholic backgrounds will often, one of the questions they will often lead with, do you have to, do you have to go to confession to receive communion in your church? Um, normally, because they don't want to do that. They want to they get far away from that. Um, my experience is the people who, who value this the most are often people coming from, from Pentecostal or evangelical backgrounds who see this as, um, as a, uh, a real plus that we, uh, we hear confessions. Not always, again, not, not, I'm not saying 100%, but it seems to appeal more to people coming from a low church side that the um, kind of the, the thing to, to uh, teach people about our, um, our confession to a priest is um, all may, um, none must, some should. Um, and, and I think that's a, a, a very helpful thing to say. Um, all are invited to make a confession to a priest. Um, if you used the um, exhortation on Sunday, I'm not going to check on to see if you did it at your churches, but um, the, the exhortation to Holy Communion um, in our new prayer book, um, where we are instructed to use it three times a year, and one of the three times was Trinity Sunday this past week, the other two being Advent, one Advent, and uh, one Lent. But there is a line in there about, uh, about confession. It says, if you have come here today with a troubled conscience and you need help and counsel, come to me or, to, or come to some other priest and confess your sins that you may receive godly counsel, direction, and absolution. To do so will both satisfy your conscience and remove any scruples or doubts. Um, so all may, but it is not a requirement. We, we do not say in order to come to Holy Communion, you must do private confession to a priest. Um, but what I want to add is some should. Um, it, it, it is, uh, again, I hate the, I, the thing about tool in our toolbox, but I'm, I'm going to use that, that terminology again. For, for some people, this is a very important step to um, to make a confession and to to hear somebody pronounce absolution over them, and, and there is great freedom that they experience in this. So that's a little bit um, about uh, understanding confession. So let let me um, let me then to. Uh, to what I think is necessary before you hear, uh, hear confession. So I've, I've got on our, our outline today, understanding confession, um, making confession. Um, before you hear confessions as a priest, you need to learn to make a confession to a priest. Um, to me, this is a, a sine qua non. Um, you, you, um, you need to learn how to yourself confess before you hear other people confess. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you seven points and I'm going to rattle them off pretty quickly and I'll tell you where they come from. Um, these are from um, Bishop John David Schofield, who was Bishop of the Diocese of San Joaquin, um, which is the, the Anglican Diocese in Central California. Before that, it was uh, a diocese of the Episcopal Church, and the whole diocese left um, the Episcopal Church under Bishop John David. Uh, and he had a marvelous gift as a confessor. Um, he taught a lot of us about how to hear confessions over the years. Uh, I, I think I went, went three different 
and it wasn't three different talks. It was like one was a whole retreat on hearing confession and making confession. Another was um, a whole course that I listened to that he did for priests. On, this is how old it was. It was a cassette tape. Um, and then I went to a retreat and I heard him make some talks. But he has seven, seven points about um, making your own confession. So that's what this is about. So before we look at the prayer book service, we've got to talk about we ourselves become confessees, uh, to be a confessee before you can be a confessor. Here's the first point. Um, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal sins you need to confess. So when you're preparing for a confession, just don't walk into a time of confession unprepared. Um, he um, John, Bishop John David uh, very specifically said, you need to spend at least 30 minutes to an hour before you make a confession and write down the, the sins that the Holy Spirit brings to mind. And he said, this is, this is the most important work you can do. Um, uh, there, are, this, there are various tools you can use. Um, the, the Ten Commandments, the seven capital sins, um, whatever helps you to begin to think about your life, you know, what troubles you um, in your conscience and things of that nature, but prepare them and, and write, write them down. Second, be honest and be brief. So for instance, um, he said, it's better to say to the priest, I lied than I embroidered the truth. Now, now they mean the same thing, but, but um, to, to be brief and, and to be um, honest, to use the words that honestly describe it. Um, uh, uh, when a, one of my old friends from Boston who is a Roman Catholic priest um, told me about a 90 year old man who had come to confession and uh, I don't think he was breaking the seal of confession. I need to be careful about this. But he said that the guy would always come in and say, impure thoughts, father, impure thoughts. Um, that's, that's not real honest <laughs> uh, on there. Okay, third, uh, don't justify yourself. Um, you need, when you do justify yourself, you don't need a savior, but you're your own savior. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis says a lot about that in, in a, a little article he wrote on forgiveness. If you've not seen that article, um, I, I really commend it. It's, it's basically about forgiving others, but he, he, a good part of the article, he says, um, we need to understand first our own need for forgiveness. And he said, when you, when you try to say, you know, Lord, I did this, but, but I'm really tired of something like that. Um, he says, the Lord knows all about our excuses. Is this a confession or are you trying to excuse yourself? So if you're trying to excuse yourself, you're your own savior. Um, you don't need a savior. Um, four, tell the priest how long it's been since your last confession. And if it's your first confession, tell him, this is the first time I've ever done this. Um, that's an important thing to, to uh, remember to do. Five, uh, give up your sins to Jesus. Don't dwell on them, but do pause um, at the end. Uh, when you make a confession, pause at the end, give a little silence to see if the Lord brings anything else to mind. Um, you're really turning over your sins to the Lord, so you don't need to dwell on them. Don't worry about, don't worry about feelings. Sin is like leprosy. It hurt um, most at the beginning, um, but makes you numb. Okay, so, you know, leprosy hurts when you first begin to kill the nerves, but then it makes you numb. So don't worry about your feelings. Um, you're, you're, you're doing a volitional act. Um, an act of the will, confessing your sins. Don't worry about what you feel like. And seven, the priest will respond with counsel, advice, and absolution. 
Uh, counsel is from the Lord. I'll say more about that. Advice is the priest's wisdom. And uh, absolution is, is the words that set free. And that, that is part of the liturgy. Yes, Yaster. Um, yes. Can, you, can you repeat six? Because I think I mixed it up with five. And then, yeah. uh, and then seven, if you can repeat seven. I was just trying sure. to catch up there. Sure. Six, don't worry about your feelings. Okay. Um, when, when you've confessed, don't worry if you still feel lousy. There is no guarantee um, of that. You've done what you need to do. And seven is, uh, th this is really um, not something you do, but the priest will respond with counsel, advice, or absolution. That's, that's our role as a priest uh, there. So that, that gets us into the whole area of making a confession. Um, and then um, when it comes to hearing a confession, um, then I have uh, I have about um, eight things on this, so I'm gonna I'm gonna quick go through them, and then we'll take a break. So this is so you've you've made your own confession. The the issue is always for a lot of people. How often should I should I do this? As an Anglican priest, I I tell people in training, um, for a priest, um, you should probably uh, do it at least three times a year. Um, the two penitential seasons, Advent and Lent. Okay. That, that long season <laughs> from, uh, uh, from the end of Easter season to, uh, to Advent again. So, uh, you know, late summer or early fall um, to make your confession. So, so it's uh, roughly about four months each and uh, kind of thing. So preparing to hear a confession. This is a series of things. Again, these are all from John Bishop John David Schofield. Um, this one I just talked about, um, make your own confession before you hear others' confession. So we think about that. Um, two, it is the Holy Spirit who convicts and Satan who accuses. So um, ask God to give you the discernment about the difference. Um, when somebody comes to you, there is a difference between conviction and accusation. And, and, and um, un understand that, that while conviction of the Holy Spirit may be uncomfortable, it feels different than accusations from, from Satan. And so as a confessor, um, part of what you're praying for hearing other people's um, confessions is to be able to help them with the difference. You know, what, what, is, what is just Satan accusing them, but what is genuine conviction of the, of the Holy Spirit? Um, three, be prepared to hear confession anytime. Um, sometimes it is not convenient when someone wants to make a confession, but God has brought that person to you right now for a specific reason. Now, obviously, if you're in the middle of the Eucharist and somebody stands up and says, um, I need to make a confession right now, Father, you don't, <laughs> you're not going to stop the Eucharist, you know, I, I, I'm in sense. But, but when, when, you know, when you're, uh, let me give you an example, you know, you're, you're, you're leaving, you're leaving a long vestry meeting. And it's been a good meeting, but it's long, you're tired, you want to go home. And some. Father, I, I really need to make a confession. Um, you know, my response was, could, would always be, can I wait till tomorrow? Um, but it can't. And, and what has been going on in that person? So, so be prepared to hear a confession at any time. Four, if you don't know the person, find out who they are. Um, have a context for hearing their confessions. Five. Um, make sure in a person's confession that they're confessing sins against God, neighbor, and self. Um, you know, I've, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against my neighbor. I've sinned against myself, self-harmful things. Six, um, if, you're, if you're preparing for a, 
for a period of hearing confessions, like a special holy day, um, make sure that you have disciplines to prepare yourself. Um, and those disciplines may include fasting or having other people pray for you, um, not, not just go into it cold. Um, seven, um, prepare the confessor for what he will be doing. Um, in other words, give a little instruction if a person has, has not, this isn't part of his or her life about what's going to happen. Um, that might include just showing them the service firsthand, walking through the service before you actually do it. Here's what you're going to do. Um, here's what, here's where you say this. Um, here's why we're doing that. Now that wouldn't be necessary for somebody who you'd seen before. And then eight, prepare a place. Um, you can hear a confession anywhere, but it's good to have a, have a, a confidential place that um, has, has a certain sense of withdrawal. Um, that's why we often hear confessions from behind the altar rail in, in churches, if we have altar rails, to place a chair on the other side of the altar rail, turn sideways so the person can speak right into one of your ears and uh, hear confessions there, or if you have a chapel. Um, now you can sit across the table or you know, in two chairs across from one another. Um, so it doesn't have to be, but if you're, if you're meeting somebody or you have a regular um, time of confession as a priest, there are people coming to you um, to have a place set aside. We, when we were, when Holy Spirit was at Bethel, they had a little prayer chapel and it was, it had a pray do and everything. It was just ideal in there. And we kept prayer books in there. And, and that's where people would come for, for their confessions right there. And there was a little sign we could hang on the outside to say, do not disturb um, when they were in there. So the door shut, you know, the pray do and everything. Okay, um, let's take a, a quick break. We've been going for an hour. Uh, when we come back, I wanna go through the actual um, service of confession and then um, we'll go through their two healing services pretty quickly at this point. But. This is, this is a big deal, which is why I'm spending a lot of time on this one. Um, it's something that we have to offer as Anglicans, and quite honestly, we probably need to make better use of it than we do right now, um, creating a climate where, where people understand that, that they can do this in our church. Okay, uh, be back in five. So one of the things you're going to need as a priest, a couple of things you're going to need, is you're going to need a travel stole, okay? So um, if you're hearing confessions in a church, um, you, you can wear your regular stole. But um, a travel stole, I, I keep one little um, bag that I carry my computer in. I also keep one in my home communion kit, I've got a couple of them. And uh, when you're hearing a confession, you're gonna need this because this is the sign that this is a sacramental confession. So one of your, your travel stall has two sides. It has a, a purple side um, for, for confession or for, for healing prayer, um, if you're anointing the sick. And if you're doing a home Eucharist or a emergency baptism, that's the white side for it. So it doesn't have anything to do with the church year so much as, as what you're actually using it, it for. Um, but um, if you're doing a confession, so I'll, I'll put it on. As soon as it's on, that signifies that what's being said is under the stole. Um, that's the term we use, which means that um, you may not uh, you may not share this with with anybody. Um, uh, and uh, this is this has actually been tested in in courts of law um, on a number of occasions. And even even if even if the law were to come after us and say you need to disclose this, it is our moral obligation to say um, the uh, this the. Uh, uh, we, we, we can't do that. I'm, I'm not getting the right term in my mind, but the, the, the uh, confession is, uh, is, it's in the prayer book someplace. The secrecy of the confession is morally binding and, and can't, be, uh, can't be broken under any condition. 
someone said to me, uh, I was talking about this the other day, somebody said to me, um, yeah, but you're a mandated reporter. And I said, yes, I am. And so there are certain things that we as priests are mandated to report. And I would, su I would assume that means um, deacons too, John. So <laughs> you're, a, you're a mandated reporter. Um, so what, what do you do if, un if under the stall, if someone confesses something which you're mandated to report? Um, you know, a, a murder, a molestation, and things like that. Um, there are two, two things you need to do. First, um, as part of preparing somebody to hear, to hear their confession, um, we need to say to them, um, yes, this, the secrecy of the confession is something we are pledged to, um, but if you're going to tell me something that I mandated to report, I cannot give you absolution until you report yourself. So we need to warn them. And if they say, well, then I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you that then we've, we've done our job uh, on that. So we can only, uh, we can only uh, extend absolution to someone who is truly penitent. And if it's, if it's uh, something that, uh, that mandates reported truly penitent would mean that um, we walk with them down to report it at that point. So um, if somebody said, I need to confess a murder, we would say, before I can give you absolution, we will go down to the police station and you will confess to them or um, any kind of uh, sexual molestation. Those are the kinds of things we're mandated to report. I would also extend that to like serious financial crime. You know, if somebody comes in and says, I embezzled 500 or a million dollars from the firm, I man and say, I can't give you absolution till you tell, tell your employer and uh, there is some kind of re agree to restore it at that point. Um, that is, uh, I think that's, I've never had one of those, so I can't tell you how that turns out. Um, I have told people at the beginning, you know, that, that as a mandated reporter, there are certain things I could not extend absolution if they didn't, and they have not done confession with me. So that does happen kind of thing. So let's look at the, um, let's look at the right. It's on page 223. We have one right. We basically borrowed this from the Roman church because we didn't have our own, as I said. Um, and um, you, you, as I said, it, my experience is it's best to, if you can be in a building or a chapel where you're seated inside a communion rail um, to sit sideways so the person can speak into your ear and have them kneel in, in, in front of you. Um, and then uh, the penitent says, bless me for I've sinned. Um, you have your lines. And then the confession here and where there is the blank, that's, that's where they need to confess um, anything that, that they have come for confession. Uh, as I said in my um, in how you prepare for confession yourself, it's good to write those out, um, and then then when you have confessed them all, to tear the piece of paper in little shreds <laughs> at that point. So there's there's no um, there's no artifact uh, left. What, one of Dorothy Sayers, Lord Peter Whimsey, uh, murder mysteries. Um, the part of the unraveling of the mystery comes because someone has been to confession and has left a slip of paper um, on which a, a crime is confessed and left it in the prayer book. And I, 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 I'm trying to remember which one it is uh, if, if you're a Dorothy Sayers fan, but it's a, it's a really interesting part of, of, the, uh, of the novel that as a priest, you go, okay, I know what's going on here, but I wonder how many other people don't get it uh, at that point. Um, and then when the confession is done, here the priest may offer counsel, direction, or comfort. As I said, um, uh, dire direction is, is, uh, is of the Lord. Counsel um, may be your own advice on things. Um, it's not a counseling session per se, but you may have some insight into some of the things that a person has. Uh, and, and then comfort in the form of absolution 
which is um, which follows on the next page. Um, it's important to to um, it's important to listen for root sins and not get distracted by um, more surface things. Pe people often feel guilty and embarrassed about the more superficial things. And so one of, one of the things that makes a good confessor is to be able to hear by the spirit and with experience that there are root things that the person either is unaware of or doesn't really consider that important. But, but those are the things that need to be brought in confession. So sometimes after someone has made a confession, not always, I'll probe a little bit and, and see um, something that's been confessed. Um, and then we pronounce absolution. There are two forms uh, of absolution. Um, uh, my, my practice has been to extend my hand over the person's head, uh, not touching them, but extend, and then making the sign of the cross. Um, and, and then as you see at the end, um, the following prayer, let us pray. Um, you pray together, which is a nice addition in this 2019 prayer book. And then the priest says, go in peace and pray for me, a sinner. Um, and so um, this is this is a very it's a very simple service um, because the real work is ahead of time and the real work is um, is in the where the blank line is. Are people going to be honest with us? Are they going to confess things? Now, here's a here's a trick. Um, and it's not proper to call it a trick. Here's a little aid. Um, I have not yet laminated this, but um, if you're in a place with prayer books, that's great. But but what if you're in a place without prayer books? So um, one of the things I, I do, and I'm going to show you, I have a whole bunch of these parts of the service that are laminated and that I can carry with me. So um, for, for instance, here's, here's the... Uh, Communion from the reserve sacrament for the sick, which is uh, we're going to look at in in a few minutes, and it's on a card. So I have a whole bunch of these. So if I'm doing a home visit, I don't need the whole prayer book necessarily. I'm, I still might take it, but um, particularly with these prayer books, they're so heavy. If you have two or three prayer books, man, it's like working out. Um, and so to maybe take my prayer book and several of these cards, if you're taking home communion or three or four people or you're in a hospital, it's much better to have one of these. It's just the service printed out and, and, and laminated. And uh, uh, I have not laminated yet, but I carry in my, in my little bag, my satchel. I have the, the, uh, the service of reconciliation here, um, reconciliation of a penitent. So if I'm traveling someplace and uh, or I'm someplace, I, I have copies of this for both myself and the person making the, the, uh, the confession there. Um, I also have, while I'm doing this um, down the road, just because I might forget it, there is uh, in the next section, uh, the section on dying, there is ministration to the sick, what we, you know, our last rites. And I just, I've had this for years. It's all on, on a little folder and I have a whole bunch of these. So if I'm going on a hospital visit and uh, e even if I'm not sure the person is dying, but a person is very sick, I take, I take you know, several of these. So um, again, I don't need to take a whole bunch of prayer books along with me. This is just years of usage. <laughs> I've, I've learned it's, it's good to have all these little pieces. Um, with you so you don't need a whole prayer book and to have them convenient, store some in your car. So they're with you. Um, I was talking yesterday to Ron Spears who is the CEO of Anglican House and we are preparing a version of the prayer book um, for visitation purposes. So it'll be smaller and just have, it won't have everything and it. it'll have um, these services in. Um, so look for that when it comes out. I don't know that there's any schedule for that coming out, but that'll be good. But it's still good to have these things. 
because I did, um, I did ministration at the time of death um, a few years ago in an ICU with 15 people standing around. Well, I'm not going to carry 15 prayer books around. Um, but I had about 10 of these and with people you know, sharing them, they could join in it. And, and the beauty of our liturgy, it's not just us as priests doing it. It's us praying together as the people of God over the things. So just just um, just a little heads up on, on that. So when you finished uh, hearing a confession, take your stole off because now you're done. And as I said earlier, um, not only are you not to tell anybody else about it, but um, we are also not to uh, approach the person who has made a confession outside of the confessional and say anything about it. So to John, who has made a confession last week as, as he's coming out of church. Hey, John, remember the thing you were talking about with me? You know, don't do that. Now, if John pulls you aside and says uh, to you, um, the thing I confessed to you, Father, last week, so that, that, that's fine because he's initiating. But you don't talk about it with other people and you don't talk about it with himself. And quite honestly, um, um, after you hear enough people making confessions, you forget most of it. Now, there's a few things outstanding that you may remember, but it's not like something you carry out. And, and one of the things in hearing confessions is to be able to, to kind of leave, you know, as the person has left his or her sins, um, you know, on the, on the table in confession, you leave them to the Lord. You're not the savior. You, you are simply declaring um, the absolution from the Lord's work. Okay, um, ministry to the sick. Um, this is, uh, again, other than the daily office or the, um, the uh, weekly Eucharist, this is the service I've used most in this in the prayer book, in the 79 prayer book, and then this, this one here is pretty much the same service. So let's talk a little bit, uh, if I'm from my notes here, about um, ministry to the sick. Got stuff shuffled all over the paper, pages here. Oh, here it is. Okay. So um, ministry to the sick really has, has biblical precedence, doesn't it? Th think about all the times in, in the Gospels where Jesus is ministering to the sick. Um, one, one of the, the texts in my, um, in my own ministry that has informed me is Matthew 4, 23 and 24. Um, and and uh, it's Matthew's way of summarizing Jesus' ministry. It says, he went about all the towns of Galilee, um, teaching in the synagogues, um, uh, and preaching the good news or evangelizing and healing the sick. And then uh, in Matthew 9, Matthew reiterates that, um, kind of rounding off Jesus' Galilean ministry with, with those things. But that's a good way for me always to think about my ministry. Um, I'm, I'm involved in the ministry of teaching. I'm involved in the ministry of proclaiming the good news of evangelizing. And I'm involved in the ministry of healing that Jesus healing ministry is extended through us through the church. Um, uh, it certainly was a ministry of the apostles. Acts 5 talks about that they, the apostles went about Jerusalem um, healing the sick. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, when it lists the gifts of the Spirit, one of the gifts is the gifts, and it's actually the only one of the gifts that's plural, it says gifts of healing. So it seems to indicate, in addition to the common ministry of the whole church, there are certain people in the church who have unique gifts of healing. And, and that's certainly been my experience. And then James 5, the famous passage. Uh, about if anyone is sick, call for the elders of the church. Um, and uh, then, then they, they lay hands on, anoint with oil, um, are, are forgiven their sins, and, uh, and uh, healing is prayed for there. And that's really the warrant for us doing it. We, you know, we're certainly doing apostolic ministry, but we're, we are 
we are presbyteros, presbyteri. We are, we are the presbyters. Um, and so part of being a priest is to have a healing ministry. And, I, and I've emphasized that again and again over the years. If you're going to be a priest, you don't have an option here. Now, what your healing ministry looks like um, might, might vary according to your, your gifts and your situations. But, but uh, minimally, you're, as a priest, you're called to pray for people and, and anoint those who are sick. And that sickness is not just physical sickness, but physical, emotional, relational, and, and spiritual. Uh, and that's, that's why this is such an important service to me, because um, it, it really has been a large part of my ministry, praying for people and anointing them. Um, you know, I served for 14 years as the rector of a, a parish um, where St. Luke was the patron. So when I came there, I said, you know, if you're a church named after St. Luke, you better have a very explicit healing ministry. Um, and for those of you who know um, the ministry of the Order of St. Luke, the physician, um, it was one of the parent churches for the beginning of the whole Order of St. Luke, uh, St. Luke, San Diego. And, Church in Philadelphia were the two places where OSL really took shape. Um, all this is by way of saying that this is not a little sidelight. Um, that that um, if you're going to be a priest, you're going to be praying for people. And you're going to be praying for their healing. And um, that means you're going to be anointing them and laying on hands as, as just part, part of your work. Um, there's a long history of healing ministry in, in the life of the church. I, I'm just, I, I'm going to skip over most of it uh, for the sake of time. But probably the best book, I, I, I recommend it advisedly because he got a little weird theologically towards the end of his ministry. Um, but there is a book by a, uh, a former Episcopal priest, he's dead now, Morton Kelsey. Um, in which he talks about Christianity and healing. And he begins back in the post-apostolic era, and he just has text after text uh, about the healing ministry of the church. And what, one of the things that he, is, uh, that he is arguing against is that somehow healing is only like, you know, 20th century Pentecostalism. Only those crazy Pentecostals, you know, pray for people and lay on hands. And, Things he said. No, this is this is a ministry of the church. It's taken different shape in different times, but um, certainly in the Roman Catholic Church, you have a robust healing ministry, um, um, healing shrines, and all sorts of things. You know, again, abuse. You know, magical things at times, but but the church has never been without a sense of a healing ministry, and in fact, the the modern medical profession in in mo most of its roots are in the Christian healing tradition and, and caring for the sick, um, particularly. And where did hospitals come from? They, they're what Christians founded in the Middle Ages to care for the sick. Um, and, uh, and modern medicine um, really took out and uh, took shape in a, in a Christian environment in, in Europe. So uh, all, all of those things by way of saying that, that healing is, is an important part of what we do as priests in the ministry of the church. Sacramental healing, um, I, I, again, back to Peter Lombard and his sentences. Um, unfortunately, sacramental healing um, became linked in the high middle ages to preparing for death. And so um, the, the last rites in the Roman church included anointing the sick but it wasn't really anointing them for healing, it was anointing them in preparation for death. And one of the good things that has happened in the 20th century is, is the Church of Rome and other churches have, have switched the emphasis about what this anointing is for and when church has done it officially. It is now a sacrament of healing, not a sacrament to prepare for, for, for death um, uh, there. And that's, that's really an important shift. The, the, um, the 1549 prayer book actually had, um, had a, a service of anointing in it, but it was, it was in line with, with the Middle Ages, practice of the middle, late Middle Ages. It was a preparation for death. Um, 
It was in, in the order for the visitation of the sick, but it was really anointing um, for death and it was very penitential. But the, the subsequent prayer books dropped it out. And, um, and it was not, not till the 1928 American prayer book that you have, again, uh, uh, anointing included in the prayer book. And it's in the 79 prayer book and then in ours where it is a sacrament of healing. Um, so that's a little bit about the history and, and the background of healing and, and why we do it. Okay, the practice, practice of healing. Um, and so I want us to look at uh, page 225. Um, this, uh, this service can be used um, on its own. It can be, um, uh, or it can be part of the visitation of the sick. So I've used it both ways, or it can be inserted into a, uh, a Holy Eucharist. So uh, when I was at St. Luke's every Wednesday at noon, we had a healing service that was a Eucharist that began uh, the way a Eucharist did. And then following, following the, um, the creed, we, this, was, this was the service minus the Lord's Prayer. And people would be invited up, and this is the the uh, the liturgy we followed. Then there would be the offertory, and then we would serve Holy Communion. So you can use this service this way, or you can just use it when you're visiting in the hospital or visiting in a home. Um, uh, on that, so that's why it's good to have this service again um, in some kind of form that people can follow along. Now, what I've done is, this is my visitation Bible. It's an it's a NRSV. I've had it for years. It's falling apart. Um, and while this doesn't have the, the person, uh, it doesn't have a liturgy people can follow along, all the pertinent prayers are taped in the back. So it's basically this service um, in the back of this Bible. And, and so, what I would do, say visiting in the hospital, I would um, I would come in, um, um, you know, introduce myself, or if it's somebody from the parish, um, get a greeting to the person, and I would usually usually do it first um, uh, upon a hospital visitation, and. Uh, what I would do then is read a portion of scripture and and. This prayer book has scriptures in it on page 235. It has appropriate scriptures. Now they're in the section about uh, prayers and things a sick person can do for himself or herself, but they're a good list of scriptures that you can use. For instance, the James five, or one of Jesus anointing scriptures. And then there are also some Psalms that, that you could use there um, on page 269. There's a right before the Psalter. There's a listing of Psalms that you could use and uh, kind of places you could use them. So I would come in, I would read this scripture, and then I would follow this liturgy exactly as it is. Um, so when I visit in a hospital and I'm anointing or in a home, sick person at home, again, put my stole on. Okay, it's it's um, it's healing, so it's purple. So this is this is again the purple side is for the healing rites, confession, um, or or the uh, healing of the sick, and I make sure I have an oil stock. Um, Esther, do you have an oil stock? Has anybody given you one? Um, John, it'll be something if you don't have one already that you should get um, down the road. So what it is, it's a it's it's a little metal container, silver, you can get them in gold, they're a lot more expensive. And it has a ring on it, so it goes right on your finger. And why that is important, because if you don't keep it in your hand on your finger when you visit, you'll, you'll lose it. And I don't know how many of these I lost before I learned get one with a ring on it. Um, I probably lost 10 of these in the hospitals over the years. Um, because they have them without. Um, inside, you have a little piece of cotton and it's soaked in, in the, the oil, 
the holy oil for anointing. And um, I, I keep this, I have one in the car, I have one in my travel bag, and anytime I make a visit, this goes with me along with my travel stall. Um, so the oil, there are different kinds of oils. Um, there used to be an article, I think it's still on the liturgy section in the, uh, for our Anglican net, our AC. But there's the oil for the anointing of the sick and it's abbreviated OI, which means uh, um, oleo um, infirmatum, oil for the infirm. There's chrism, which is used for, for confirmations um, and um, ordinations. And the difference is that chrism is usually mixed with some balsam, so it's fragrant. So the bishop will have chrism and, he, and that's usually in a gold container, not always, but we can usually tell the difference. And then there's the oil of exorcism um, that's also used for the catechumenates because catechumenate is, is a kind of exorcism. So those are the three kinds of oils, blessed oils. When are oils blessed and by whom? Do you know? They're blessed by the bishop and the traditional time to bless them is on Monday, Thursday. Um, to have a gathering of the clergy on Monday, Thursday. Um, gathering of the clergy um, reaffirmation of vows and blessing of the oils for the next year. Now, because we're such a far-flung diocese, we, we, we just can't do that. Um, we, we did it for years when I was in the Episcopal Diocese of San Diego because it was you know, geographic. But in our diocese, we can't do that. You'll notice that we, um, well, I don't know if you've been. John, have you been to Synod at all yet? Yeah, okay, that's when we do it. When we're gathered at Synod in the fall in October, we'll have reaffirmation of our clergy vows. Um, so deacons, priests, and bishops all reaffirm their vows and, and blessing of oils. And, and so the, you, just, you just don't go buy a bunch of oil you know, someplace and use it yourself or, or you know, fa Father Bill's oil factory. Um, you use the blessed oils from our bishop. Um, and the symbolism is really, is really potent. I, I try to explain this to people when I anoint them, particularly if they're not used to this. I say this oil is not magic, but it symbolizes the prayers of the whole diocese. I'm not the only one praying for you. Um, you are being prayed for symbolically by all of our churches in the seven states um, through the office of the bishop. Um, that's a pretty potent symbol when, when you think of it uh, there. So um, ministry to the sick. Um, uh, this, is, this is where uh, it comes in who can do it. And again, um, the rubric there, the priest or other authorized persons anoints the sick person. So lay people can do this. Um, deacons can do it. Um, but they need to be authorized by the, by the priest who is in charge of their parish, who is basically supervising them. And I would never authorize a person who I had done an extensive amount of training um, with, training in healing ministry, training in um, um, just general practices of ministry, you know, touching, when not to touch, what not to do, all the kinds of things of, say, of our church safe stuff too. So the, the training is uh, quite extensive. When we did it for OSL, um, it, it was uh, basically about uh, 10 to 15 weeks of training, plus going through diocesan um, stuff on safe conduct. And um, so it, it, was, it was not a lightweight thing. I mean, it didn't make them clergy, obviously, but it, it gave them a lot of background on them. Um, and so you can, you can read through um, this on your own again. You anoint, um, you, you pray for the person, um, Lord's Prayer together, and then there is the Almighty Lord, the prayer at the end. Um, 
as I said, this was after the daily office and the uh, weekly Eucharist, this was the part of the prayer book that is most used by me over the years. So again, just, just no, I, I basically had it memorized. That's why I, I didn't need this. And the little parts that I might forget were just uh, taped in the back, uh, copied and taped in the back of my Bible. My, my visitation Bible, by the way, um, when you get to James 5, there, there are oily fingerprints along the margin, because that was often what I would use there um, would be the James 5 one, not that often. Okay, um, good, we're, we're moving right along here. Communion of the sick. Um, so this is really a right for communion um, from the reserved sacrament. Now you can do a home communion um, you can consecrate a, a, as a priest, you can come and consecrate home communion. And that was, that was Anglican practice. Um, uh, people in the, in the early prayer books, people were not uh, communed from the, from the reserved sacrament. They were the, uh, the, the bread and the wine would be blessed. You would blessed. You would basically do a home communion, um, complete with consecration and, and everything. And that's, that's fine. Um, I'm not arguing against that, but particularly in a hospital setting or a nursing home setting, um, it's or when you have lay people who are trained, communion of the sick here is a really good service to uh, to know and to have people uh, be involved in. We know that the communion was taken from the altar by the deacons in the second century, and indeed some lay people were allowed to take communion. So, so when there was a, a communion at, at, the, at the central church in a city or a town, when it was over the, immediately the deacons um, would, would take communion to those who could not uh, come out and also would take anointing oil. Um, one, of the, one of the abuses was sometimes people would try to drink the anointing oil, you know, figuring if, if, it's, if it's good to have on your forehead, it's even better to drink kind of, kind of thing. Um, again, uh, just, just to underscore what I said, this is really a good service to have laminated cards for. And we, at, at, at Holy Spirit, we have two different ones. We have, this is the priest card because I'm a priest. But we also have one, uh, and this, this only has the stuff on it that pertains to priests and everybody. The other one is a lay card for our, our deacons or our lay people in communion, and that has the stuff that pertains. So you notice here, um, as it goes along, it says, uh, bottom of page 228, a priest if present says, and then, or a deacon or a lay person. So the priest card only has the priestly prayer, the lay person or the deacon only has the lay person thing. That's just a, a, a little thing. So it's not confusing. And that way you can get it on big print on one, one, uh, one card front and back. That's the other thing. If you do this, make sure it's big print, um, partly for your sake, because sometimes if you're in a nursing home, it's dim, but also a lot of times you're visiting elderly people whose sight isn't good. And so um, I, I think this is, this is at least 14, this might be 16 point print on it. Um, and so it was adjusted so I could fit it on one card there. But you can see how this, um, how this goes. Um, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, and then the, the colic for purity, um, a, a psalm or uh, a lesson uh, that, that might, be, uh, might be read. Um, normally that would be, for me, that would be um, a, a gospel from last Sunday, or if it was a holy day, for instance, Christmas, the Christmas gospel. So that would be uh, where I would read from. 
um, there. Um, if you want to do a short one, the short ones are here from John and John 6. I don't use those very often. I usually read, read a, a gospel from the day. Um, additional comments um, and then prayer of confession, um, absolution or, or the prayer of forgiveness. Um, they are the, uh, the Our Father, um, the Lamb of God, and then the giving of communion and the, the saying of together. So, so this is, um, this takes about 10 minutes. Um, and uh, it is, uh, it's a nice, it's a nice service that, uh, that I find people really find helpful. I remember visiting, oh, it was years ago. I, I'm even forgetting where, and I, I, and I was I was trained that when you do a visit um, in the hospital or um, in a nursing home where they can't get out, you you always take your communion kit with you. Um, people can say no, but if you don't have your communion kit with you, you can't give them communion. And I remember visiting somebody in the hospital and uh, and giving him communion, and him looking at me, and and tears were running down his cheeks. He said, "You know, that's that's the first time I've ever had had a priest visit me and give me communion." And I thought, "Wow, <laughs> that, that's pretty amazing." Because to me, it just goes to territory. Um, you're you. This is this is part of our understanding of priesthood that that we're 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 not just offering the word and and comfort. We're offering sacramental life to people. And, and and so this is to to put it kind of um, indelicately. This is why I got into the business of being a you know an Anglican priest and, and not just a congregational minister, because I wanted to give people more than just a prayer and a reading from Scripture and some of my thoughts. There's nothing deficient about that, but it felt incomplete. I wanted to give them, um, you know, the body and blood of Christ. I wanted to anoint them with oil. I wanted to do sacramentally um, what what our tradition says is important for priesthood. And I and I and I say that because I hope that's I hope that's part of your understanding of priesthood. Um, one of the things, and and you know, John, you've heard Bishop Keith a little bit on that this week. One of the things is we have people coming into the priesthood from all sorts of different directions and traditions. Um, and, and we want them to understand this isn't just, um, you know, evangelical ministry and we get to wear colors. There's a whole, there's a whole layer uh, that we, it's not even a layer, there's a whole orientation that we want people to have that 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 these kind of sacramental things are 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 at the center of what we do not just the proclamation of the word we are of the sacrament and our pastoral ministry is ministry of word and sacrament not just word and so that's why um, these are all played out um, the rest of this section is um, different prayers, and uh, we don't need to look at those, but these are prayers uh, for the sick person, by the sick person. Um, why it's good if you visit somebody who is in the hospital or inbound or nursing home or in uh, you know, extensive recovery from an injury uh, in a rehab center that you make sure that in addition to a Bible, that they have a prayer book. Um, we, we, we are biblical people first and foremost. Um, and so you may wanna, one of the things you may wanna do is to buy a set of cheap Bibles. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting what version it was, but I remember we got a case of versions, you know, they were cheap paper and stuff. And I, I think we paid like, two or three dollars a piece for them, you know, probably lasted about a month. But um, that's what they were for, to give out to people, to take in visitations. Um, because people, sometimes they don't think about having a Bible and to say, no, this isn't a loan, you can have it. 
um, but also to have prayer books. Uh, our prayer books are a little bit more expensive, but encouraging people to have them, or if they don't, to have some loaner copies. Um, I shared with you back in my opening lecture that one of the one of the major reasons that I started exploring Anglicanism was because I bought a 1979 prayer book in 1976 and stuck it in my bag when I had to be in the hospital for 24 days and just started trying to figure out what this prayer book was about and found it a great resource there. So we, we are people of, of the book, the Bible and people of the prayer book. And it is resources like this in the prayer book for people who aren't used to praying, prayers for use by a sick person, scriptures for use by a sick person, um, psalms to pray in it and uh, that that's part of uh, part of pastoral ministry too is making that available for people okay so um, I actually finished on time today which is a which is a first for me because uh, I think we got through all the things um, any any questions or comments I know we've raced through a lot um, but I, I, uh, I think this is really valuable territory um, for us to cover. Yeah, yes, Esther. Can you show, I don't know if it's possible, but if you can show like your travel bag or if your kit's in there. Um, but so you, do you have reserve sacrament in there waiting or do you take that from the altar at the church? Uh, you have to stop by the church and have it in some sort of a, a tabernacle or Ombre. Yeah, um, I can I can show you. I'm going to I'm going to shut off the recording. It'll take me about 15 seconds and and I'll show you what I have. And 